Welcome to the Confidence Through Health Podcast. My name is Jerry Snyder. As a health, wellness, and sports performance coach, my goal each week is to bring you experts to help you take control of your health and build your self-confidence. Thanks for including me today on your journey to better health. I want to say thank you to Social Media Cowboys for sponsoring this week's episode of the Confidence Through Health Podcast. If you need help with a website, if you need social media needs for your business, if you need help with AdWords, SEO, all those things that you know you should be doing but you are too busy to do or you're too confused about, they are the experts that you need in your corner. If you're interested in launching a podcast such as mine, they help me edit my podcast and do a fantastic job making sure that all of the technical side of it is handled and we launch a nice, neat, edited podcast episode each week. So I want to thank Social Media Cowboys for their continued sponsorship of the Confidence Through Health podcast. You can find them at socialmediacowboys.com or you can find them as well with other sponsors at confidencethroughhealth.com. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for being a guest on the Confidence Through Health podcast. It's my delight to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Jerry. So I, I'm excited because we have to talk about headaches. And, and as I told you, I've had somebody recently on, we talked about headaches, but this this is a little bit, I think, going to be a little bit deeper conversation and and, and I'm excited about that. But what is it about, like, you, you went to school, you you know, you're, you're a doctor, you've got all this, like, what, what was it about headaches or the, working with the brain or working with migraines that for you was like, that's the area I want to fill in for people? You know, I'm, I'm really interested in migraines because I had them myself. Okay. They started for me in my third year of medical school. Um, and I was having these horrific headaches that I couldn't quite treat with just, uh, Excedrin and caffeine and, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of things that I was, that I was trying to use. And, um, uh, I was starting to go blind from them and we hadn't oh, wow. gotten to that part of pathophysiology that, uh, or sorry, they started my second year of med school, not my third. Um, we hadn't gotten to that, to that brain section of study during medical school. So I just didn't know what they were. Yeah. Um, and I was trying to get through, you know, clinic and, and. Uh, all of the, the learning that I had to do during medical school. Um, and so it wasn't until um, we got to that part of study that I was like, oh, that's what's going on here. And this was at the in the early knots, uh, so around 2001, 2002, yeah. and sumatriptans were just brand new on the market. There wasn't really anything else. And those sumatriptans were outrageously expensive. I um, and I was getting a lot of headaches over the course of the month, and they were something like $130 or $150 for a package of nine pills. Oh and gosh. so I had to learn how to manage these headaches yeah. because I was under a lot of stress and trying to, you know, learn a lot of things, drinking from a fire hose, as it were, from school. Yeah. And then at the same time, couldn't always focus and concentrate the way that I wanted to. And, and you know, my, my right eye would go blind and all kinds of things. So um, then when I went through my surgery residency, they got profoundly worse. And then it wasn't until I got into acupuncture and traditional East Asian medicine and learned about integrative medicine that I really started resolving them for myself. I was really just kind of using beta blockers to keep a tamp right. knot on them, uh, not really fixing the underlying program. So that's or problem, excuse me. That's why I, I got into, you know, learning a lot more about migraines mm -hmm. and I end up treating a lot of patients that have migraines. Right. And so... So well, one thing I want to make sure that like complete side note, but like coming from a doctor saying we, you know, we understand that medication can be outrageous sometimes, like, even though it's like, it may be the best thing to it, not necessarily cure the cause, but to help you with your symptoms. Sometimes it's just not possible to go that route and there's got to be another way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I really am a big believer in empowering people to be able to make decisions about what can help them in the moment, mm -hmm. not just, you know, being reactionary. In, in in our country, we tend to be very reactionary. You know, you, yeah. you have a problem and then you wait until your blood pressure is high and then you take a blood pressure pill to try to bring it back down rather right. than trying to prevent it from getting to that point. Yeah. And so isn't it lovely that we have lots of tools at our disposal that can prevent migraines from happening and can decrease the frequency um, for which they occur, that we don't just have to be kind of reactionary and take medications in response to them. Right. And so, and then for you to dig in, like, just, I, mean, I don't know if you've ever had anybody ask you this question, but I wonder if, if you had not been in medical school and being under all that stress of 
you know, the, the long hours, the, the massive amounts of information you're trying to learn. Um, and obviously the, the, there is a definite competitive piece to medical school, right? Like, yes. had you not been in all of that, do you think that you would have developed, mig developed migraines anyway? Well, it's interesting. There's, there is a genetic component mm -hmm. and my sister had them as well. Okay. Um, I don't know that my mom or my father ever had them uh, to speak of, or they, they didn't complain about them per se, mm -hmm. but there is a genetic component. So there's a possibility that I may have had them either way, but okay. certainly being under all that stress did not help matters. Right. Because stress is, I mean, whether it's a migraine or a regular headache, I, I think we all know stress can bring on headaches if we're not preparing and taking care of ourselves properly through all that. Um, so what, like from a definition standpoint, what what defines a migraine versus like just a, you know, a standard headache that people get? Well, if you don't mind, I'll, I'd like to back up that uh, question just a sure. little bit and talk about how a migraine happens. Sure. Because in that, then we start to understand kind of what differentiates it from a tension right. headache or a cluster headache or something like that. Sure. So there is still a lot of argument in the medical literature about exactly what is happening, happening and at what point during the process of developing a migraine headache. It's not the same thing as, um, as a tension headache. It's, it's a much longer process. Right. And there's a little structure in the brain called the hypothalamus, and it regulates pain processing. It controls our sleep-wake cycle. It deals with feeding and thirst and arousal, how, how awake we are or how sleepy. And it also interacts with the autonomic, which means the stuff we don't have to think about in our body, how quickly our heart is beating, how fast we're breathing, whether our digestive system is working. And it also interacts with the endocrine system. So if you think about just that set of of components that the hypothalamus interacts with, it makes a lot of sense about all the things we're going to talk about with migraine headache. Yeah. And there's some suggestion that the hypothalamic has a regulatory function for nausea and vomiting, for changes in appetite, and for energy level. So there's this activation of the hypothalamus that happens. And then something called a cortical spreading depression, which cortical means brain. Mm -hmm. And it slowly spreads typically from kind of the back where the hypothalamus is in the head towards the front. And there's, it's this depolarization of the gray matter, which is the, the nerves of the brain, which then kind of makes you feel a little bit sluggish, a little bit confused. Your brain is not working correctly. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people will report, oh, I, I'm going to get a migraine. They start to feel it even if they're not having auras, which is kind of physical symptoms, they're right. kind of like, oh, I can feel a headache coming. Yeah. And what happens when that depolarization happens is that there's reduced blood flow. And then there's a great big, huge nerve that kind of comes out the side of the face called the trigeminal nerve. It has mm -hmm. three branches, trigeminal, mm -hmm. and one goes to the eye. One goes kind of to the upper part of the jaw and one goes down to the lower part of the jaw. And it sort of comes together close to the ear. So that trigeminal nerve then sends signals out which release pro-inflammatory mediators. And then this big inflammation starts to happen on the blood vessels that surround one of the coatings of the brain, the pia mater. Right. And that provokes pain and headaches in the both the central and the peripheral nervous system. So you're experiencing the headache in your head. But a lot of people will also have shoulder pain or neck pain right. or pain that radiates down to their arms and so forth. So already we can see just from the way that this migraine is happening, that this is a really different headache than just yeah. a headache that's just in your head, right? Right, right. Um, And that inflammation also leads to changes in the one side of the brain that it's activated on in blood brain barrier permeability. And most people are aware that there's this kind of stopgap measure. There are these, mm -hmm. these sentinels that are standing there saying, no, you can't come in, or yes, you can come in to various chemicals and nutrients and so forth that get from, from the outside of the brain into the brain. Right. Well, that blood brain barrier permeability also gets shifted through mm -hmm. matrix matrix uh, metalloproteinases. So we'll talk about that in terms of triggers, but that is why food is such an important component of migraine um, uh, etiology, the, mm -hmm. the causes behind migraine. Um, and so when we talk about migraine, we divide it into two big broad categories. One that is with an aura, and that is about 75% of people that have migraines don't have an aura. Okay. This is a, a recurrent headache. It lasts for between four and 72 hours. 
it's typically on one side only. And the name migraine comes from the Greek or the really kind of the Latin hemigraina, which is hemi is half, right? And they just took the H-E out of it when it sort of got moved into France uh, yeah. because the French don't pronounce half their letters. Um, right. <laughs> so migraine comes from this idea that it's only on one side of the head or the other. It generally is a really pulsating headache, kind of this mm-hmm. throbbing, you know, right. gets a little bit bigger and a little bit less. And it's moderate to severe in intensity. It's worse with movement. It's worse with light. It's worse with loud sounds. And it typically gives you some nausea. So there's a lot of things happening with this headache rather than just having head pain. Right. Um, When people do have an aura, it's fully reversible attacks. They usually are really short. And they'll have visual or sensory or speech, language, motor um, sometimes even things with, with eyes that then are followed by a headache and migraine symptoms. Right. So they'll first get this like particular sensation in their body. That's, that's really widely varied. And then the headache comes after that. Okay. So with so, the, with the, and this is a type of headache that doesn't necessarily travel. If it, if it's, am I right? Because you said if it's, if it's really affecting half the brain, like because I know some headaches will travel, like you'll you'll initially get it in like your forehead and then it like will go to the left side or the right side and as it just sort of like develops, but that's more of a traditional headache where it's yeah. just your brain swelling, you've got you know high blood pressures going on or something's going on, and you just you're dealing with stress. Right. But this is more like it, it's it's really affecting half this, you know, one half of the brain or the other, which then of course would could also, you know affect that side you know the other side of the body as you're trying to do things right like it's going to have more pronounced is it is it is it going to get into that like like a stroke affects one half of the body or the other is it is it not generally yeah generally speaking we're talking about um kind of generalized nerve depolarization Mm -hmm. and the covering of the entire side of the brain so it's not going to affect just your arm or just your leg in the same way that a stroke or or a seizure or something like that would okay yeah okay Um, an attention type headache which is that stress type of headache Mm -hmm. is usually on both sides it generally comes from you know having your your shoulders up by your ears right. and lots and lots of tension. Yep. And it can last anywhere from 30 minutes to seven days. Yeah. The person feels a lot of pressure and tightness, but they're able to, to stay active. Right. They'll have a headache, but but looking at bright lights doesn't hurt. Hearing loud sounds doesn't hurt. They're able to move. They don't have yeah. to kind of close the door in a dark room. Right. Um, so that's a know, big a cluster. That's, that's a big, like, because I know you said seven days. So I know a lot of people that will say they've got a migraine because it just it lasts long. So, so migraine, a headache that lasts long is not necessarily a migraine. It becomes really difficult to tease out all these different pieces. Yeah. You're exactly right. Just because the headache is lasting for a long time does not mean it is definitely a migraine. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, and then a cluster headache is usually on one side or the other, and it has kind of a sudden start around the eye or sort of mm-hmm. around the temple. Um, And it progresses to a really continuous deep pain and usually lasts anywhere between 15 minutes to three hours. So this has a lot of eye symptoms. Mm -hmm. So your eye will get red. You might, your nose might run. You might have some sweating. You might feel kind of uh, irritated and that kind of thing, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's not the same thing as this throbbing intense pain that you get when you're having a migraine. Okay. Um, But it's, all of those are still like, no, no matter what kind of headache it is, that's that's more still of a, a, a sign that something's off or imbalanced or is is because the headache is not the root cause of the problem, right? There's something else that maybe needs to be adjusted, like whether it's nutrition or, you know, your exercise or something else in your life that needs to be like balanced out, right? Yeah. So if you're asking me as an MD. Yeah there are things that you can do to prevent or things that we know are triggers. Mm -hmm. If you're asking me as an integrative clinician, then there's lots of preventative things that we can do. So um, we know that triggers are definitely a stress, uh, you know, it's like an 80% um, 
in 80% of people that tend to have migraines, stress is, is a contributing factor. Oh, wow. And certainly the hormonal changes that women have um, about over half, I would say somewhere between 60 and 65% of women experience some, some intense headaches during their menstrual cycle. Okay. Um, skipped meals is another one that is very commonly cited as a problem. And then there are lots and lots of food um, allergies and sensitivities that are contributing components. Mm -hmm. um, and then some other things like noxious intake. So that might be alcohol, that might be smoking, that might be aspartame, uh, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Right. And the reason that stress is so closely linked with exercise is because exercise reduces stress. Right. So doing more exercise means you have less stress, which means, you know, it's also kind of a contributing factor. So those are the right. MD sides of the conversation. Right. And that's, that's, I think stuff that most people, most people have heard, most people sort of like relate to that and go, okay, well, yeah, I understand, uh, you know, exercise reduces stress. I understand when I eat something or, you know, have a really stressful day at work. I understand that, you know, there's a potential for headache to be associated with that. Or, or if I'm, you know, like spending an uh, inordinate amount of time at a computer when I don't usually do that, you know, that could lead to a headache. Um, but, but on the, on the other side of it, like, what are, what are things that people can be doing that really take it control, you know, the holistic side of taking control and being able to avoid you know, okay, well, I got a headache. I'm just going to reach for the Advil or the Excedrin or whatever medication that I've, you know, can find. Like, what can we do to make sure that like, like, and and I'm saying that saying that I know because I, I, I think it's been over a decade since I've had a headache. So, I mean, it's things that I've been doing and that I try yeah. and preach to people, but it's like hearing it from other voices is always a great thing too. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So the number one thing that I find in my clinic um, and in myself that has made a big difference is magnesium. Mm -hmm. um, magnesium is, is, a, is an element. It's something that lives on the periodic table. So it's like calcium and sodium and potassium and so forth. And magnesium lives on the left side of the table. It's closely associated with calcium. Okay. So the body regulates calcium and magnesium kind of interchangeably in some ways. And it's needed for muscle contraction, for nerve signaling, for blood pressure regulation, for making bone, for making DNA, and then also for converting food substances into biochemical energy. And most people with migraines, I find they just don't have enough magnesium in their system. And most of the current medical literature talks about uh 250 milligrams of magnesium per day is what mm -hmm. the RDU is. I frequently dose people, and I'm, I'm hesitant to say this. So to all of you listeners, I beg you to please go and have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with your doc. What I'm about to describe to you is not something to take lightly and to start taking into your own hands without the advice of a trained clinician. Right. Because nothing is without side effects, right. and I don't want to cause any harm to anybody but I will also disclose that I tend to dose people by five times their body weight in divided okay. doses. So if somebody weighs a hundred pounds, then they can take 500 milligrams per day. I wouldn't recommend you take that all at once because right. no matter what kind of magnesium salt you're taking, you're going to have loose stools with right. that, right. <laughs> but taking 250 twice a day or, yeah. you know, up to 900, 1200 milligrams a day, um, can cause, you know, irregular heartbeats and stuff like that, right. but it also can be a huge release for migraine problems. Right. And the recommended amount for women who are menstruating is a little bit higher, 310 to 320. I think I said 220. I'm sorry, I misspoke there in the beginning, yeah. but between 310 and 320 milligrams. Um, but I find that, that women need twice and sometimes three times that amount. Um, foods that are completely safe and absolutely you can take um, without worry that are high in magnesium are pumpkin seeds, chia seeds, um, legumes. So mm -hmm. everything that's in kind of the bean and pea family, right. uh, almonds, peanuts, kidney beans, black beans, edamame. And then of course, because legumes, are soy milk, uh, mm -hmm. you know, soy, soy milk, tofu, you know, all that kind of thing. Right. Um, so yeah, so I, I find that super, super helpful. So you mentioned that that and I don't want to necessarily like completely sidetrack us, but you mentioned that magnesium helps with nerves, and like how much of 
you know, because uh, I, I think we've probably all it, at some point said a phrase of, you know, when you're either when you've got a headache or you develop a headache, it's like you're getting on my nerves. Like it's just like because it's like you know, <laughs> it's like I need some time away. You're getting on my nerves. It's causing me to get to this level of like I can't take it anymore. Um, uh -huh. How much is a headache related to like whether it's overstimulation of nerves or the nerves aren't working as, as well as they should like as if magnesium i'm just maybe i'm just putting this together and like but you said magnesium helps with nerves like is that is that a piece of the puzzle is that why magnesium helps so much i think i, I can't say that for sure okay um i i think you know, stress is something that means something very different whenever you're talking about it online right. or, you know, just kind of reading it in a, in a Vogue article or something than right. it does when we talk about it in terms of being a doctor. Yeah. So stress means cortisol release. It means epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, it, it has some very specific effects that we talk about in, in medical land. Right. Um, but all of those things do have an impact on physiology overall. And in our bodies, when we experience stress, it kind of activates the sympathetic nervous system, which is our right. fight, flight, freeze, and fawn system, right? Yeah. And the components of that are that our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up, the blood flows away from the central body cavity and goes out to those big muscles so that we can fight, our, fight off that bear that's attacking right. us. Um, and so that means that the blood flow already is is moving in ways that are not designed to support um, calm and uh, rest and digest and, and all of those kinds of things. We're not doing any infrastructure repair when that is happening. Yeah. Um, and when we're stressed because it disrupts sleep, that also means that the brain doesn't get cleaned out as well. The only mm -hmm. time that we remove toxins from the brain or you know metabolic byproducts, I should say, not even just toxins, is when we're sleeping. Right. So if sleep is disrupted, the brain is dirtier, for lack of a better way right. to describe yeah. that, right? Yeah. There's more gook yeah. kind of built up in that space. It's like having right. a sore muscle after a good workout. Your brain feels sore in that same way, right. just kind of puffy, and it doesn't work as well. But we don't have the link clear, as, as far as my understanding, and I'm not a neurologist, yeah. um, we don't have the, the clear link between lack of sleep making the brain have more metabolic byproducts and that equals more migraines. Mm -hmm. It looks like those things are linked, but a cause and effect is really difficult mm -hmm. to describe in medicine. Yeah. So yeah. we can say these things tend to cohabitate, right. you know, but that doesn't mean a cause and effect. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So after magnesium, what else can people look at to, to help on the preventative side of how do I, whether it's to completely get rid of them or at least lessen the effect of them when they do happen. Well, you know what, Jerry, before we move into that question, yeah. one other thing that I just want to mention about magnesium mm -hmm. is that the magnesium is always bound to something. Oh, right. So yep. it's given as magnesium chelate or magnesium oxide or magnesium citrate or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you want to, to do a little poking around, if you use magnesium oxide or magnesium hydroxide, that's the primary component of milk of magnesia. Okay. So that's great if you wanna take magnesium to help with constipation, Right. but it doesn't really get into the bloodstream, which doesn't mean it gets into the brain or the muscles or the heart or any of the other places that you kind of want the magnesium to go if you're using it as a preventative. Right. So magnesium citrate, magnesium lactate, magnesium three and eight uh, is better absorbed in the body overall. And so that makes it more bioavailable. So it's not right. just staying in the digestive system. So I don't want right. people giving themselves lots of loose stools in the process. We want to use the magnesium and not to anywhere get to with it. <laughs> the place where we want it to go. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next thing that I find is really helpful for trying to avoid and prevent migraines is food. Mm -hmm. And one of the most common triggers that I have found in my clinical practice for migraines is dairy. Okay. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the person has an allergy. Again, allergy is one of those words like stress that means something really yeah. specific when I'm talking to my MD colleagues. Right. Um, it means an IgE uh, type of 
antibody is getting created. It means mast cell degranulation. It means something really, really specific. And when you go to see an allergist, they do tests on your skin to try to get that hypersensitivity response, like, like right. a mosquito bite in response yeah. to dairy. Food sensitivities have, um, have increasing uh, science behind them. And again, clinically, I find it very helpful to conceptualize whether the body is responding to these um, kind of low-grade inflammatory responses that change the relationship between how food gets into the body. The cells in the small intestine are kind of sit next to each other. They don't have, they don't touch in the right. same way that they do in other parts of the body. They have like a little gate that goes between them. So if you eat some, you know, some bad rice that's been sitting out for too long in the summer sun at a picnic, and it has lots of bacteria in it, there's a little receptor called the toll-like receptor number four that gets activated in the sm first part of the small intestine that sounds this big alarm. And those gates that are between the cells whoosh out a whole bunch of fluid into the tube of the gut. And that washes that rice out of your system and you have diarrhea right. or washes it into your system and you vomit. So mm -hmm. it expunges those bacteria before they can cause any problems. Right. But, but that, that TLR4 receptor is not like an on off switch. It's more like a dimmer switch. So some foods um, can cause that dimmer switch to be turned on just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that means the gates are open a little bit or some of the gates are open a little bit. Right. And that also means it's not a one-way street. The foods that you eat can also then kind of pass between the cells. And instead of going through an Amazon packaging plant where they have a box and a stamp and, and an address and the body like recognizes them and knows yep. what to do with those amino acids, you get little chunks of yogurt and ice cream and you know whatever else it is that you're eating. And then your body says, oh, that is not Jerry. Right. I better do something about that. That's something trying to attack Jerry. Yeah. So it makes these low grade inflammatory responses to the foods that you're eating. And dairy and gluten are some of the most common causes of that. Mm -hmm. So if the person who's experiencing migraine wants to do an elimination diet for a couple of, I would say it, it takes several months yeah. to, to really do an elimination diet and clear your system out from that. It can be very, very common that they find that, oh, dairy really precipitates it, but it doesn't precipitate it in the way that I eat dairy. I have a headache an hour later. Right. It can be over the next 72 hours. So you really have to track the food that you ate, yeah. then the time and the time that you ate it, then the symptoms that happen and the time that the symptoms start to happen. Yeah. And then you can say, oh, when I ate dairy for breakfast this morning, I have a migraine consistently in the evening. And that's just because it takes time from the food to get from one end of your intestinal system to the other. <laughs> right, right. And so that that inflammatory process tends to happen in the small intestine and people just have different transit times that it takes yeah. to get through your through your gut tube. Yeah. So, so is yeah. that like um, knowing that it could, knowing that it could take 72 hours to like really see like, OK, is this affecting me or not? And so it's like. That you, like you said, that due diligence to do everything. Is that one of the, one of the reasons why it's so easy to just say, I'm just going to take a pill for some people. It's like, like they haven't hit that, like make or break. Like I am, I am finished with this. I need to find the solution. It's like, I can just take a pill and it'll help mask. And I just got to take another pill, whether it's four hours or eight hours or however long later until the headache goes away. Yeah. I I really feel for people, you yeah. know, you just never know what their life is like and yeah. how much they can add to their plate on top of everything else. That was not a great metaphor, but how much no, more yeah. they can add to what they need to do over the course of the day. Yeah. You know, I, I know so many single moms and single dads and single parents who are trying to navigate a household and do all the things for their family and, you know, get healthy food on the table and then yeah. also work and do homework. And, you know, what am I going to do with my munchkins for the summer? And even people that don't have kids, you know, they're traveling and, and right. so forth. So um, I, I also really appreciate that there are pharmaceuticals out there that can help yeah. us with things. Yeah. So um, I don't, uh, 
I don't give people a hard time for needing to take pills for things. Right. Um, but I also just try to offer solutions that are, well, we can try to eliminate the number of times you have to take a pill or the right. amount of time that this is affecting your lifestyle. Yeah. 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 Um, because ultimately the, 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 the quicker we could find the root cause and eliminate that, the better it's going to be in the long run. Right. Like, like having, having, having the ability to like, okay, I messed up. I've, I, I didn't know that there was dairy in this or whatever, if that's your trigger, having the ability to take a, a, a pharmaceutical to help, that's absolutely, that's beautiful. And it's great that it works, but to only be relying on the pharmaceutical, not say, okay, I, I, I really need to figure this out because that root cause, while it may be just causing a migraine right now, but it could be causing multiple things down the road if it's already something that's disrupting your body, correct? Yes. And I, I really appreciate the tactic that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it is just overwhelming for people. Right. Like, yeah, I agree with course. you that preventative medicine is the way to go, right? We yeah. would all love to just live to be 100 and have absolutely no symptoms for any right. problem ever. Right. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's not always possible for people. And right. I, I, I went to, um, for myself, I always want to treat people with a lot of compassion if they're needing to use pharmaceuticals and so forth and, and don't want to, uh, to create shame or make people feel badly right. about their choices if that's what they can manage. Right. Right. Um, I also really believe in you know crutches. Uh, right. As you're getting better, you sprain your ankle, like please use some crutches for a little while right. while your yeah. body is recovering from that. Yeah. Yep, yep. So, and then on, on food sensitivities, that's that's something that I think a lot of people are starting to become more familiar with. Um, you know, and, and how that interacts with different parts of our bodies, right? It's not just that you eat something and you have a food sensitivity to it. And it's just a, a gut reaction because like right. you said, it, it, it can trigger so many different things down the road, um, with migraines being one of them, like how is it, is it, is it something that if somebody identified, like somebody identified dairy as their trigger, is it like a complete I've just got to be off dairy completely, or is it different for different people? Like I can have a little bit and not have effects because, you know, the, the gates only open a little bit. So only a little bit gets in and the body can handle a certain amount. Is that a trial and error basis for most people? It's a little bit trial and error, but it's also, you know, if you're a woman getting ready to have her period in a high stress situation and also drinking more alcohol, and then on top of it, you have some dairy then that can kind of push you over the edge. So you you have to sort of sit with um, with all of those different factors and kind of combine, you know, where how how militant do I need to be with myself about avoiding right. food triggers for this particular week of the month, um, or for this particular stress level, or you know, for exam week, or or right. something along those lines. Right. Yeah. So it it doesn't always. It's I really don't think about migraines as being an on off switch. Um, they're also kind of a dimmer switch, you know, it, right. it's an additive effect of all sorts of things. Yeah. Okay. And then if it does start to come on, like, is there, is it just a, like, I, I hit the trigger, the switch is coming on, like, is, is there a way to, to stop it or slow it? Or is stop it just it. like, uh, you know what, I, I, I hit the switch, it's on, and it's going to stay on for X amount of hours. That is the subject of a lot of research right now in yeah. the in medical land. Um, they haven't found anything that is a good way to kind of stop the migraine. We know that the medications, if you take uh, a sumatriptan or or a, a, a you know a, a triptan medicine mm -hmm. with an anti-inflammatory, it tends to work better, which makes sense, right? Because you created this inflammatory cascade, and so that helps to decrease the inflammation. Um, I often use acupressure points. Mm -hmm. So using points that are sort of around the ear and at the base of the skull to slow down that, um, that depolarization that's happening. Um, there's another point called LI4 for those of you that are just listening and not looking, but it's kind of right at the base mm. between the junction of the index finger and the thumb. And if you were a child and making like a little mouth, this, this right. like looks like a little mouth, right? So this is the head, the, the kind of command point of the, the head. Yeah. And that point has a very strong downward uh, signaling in the in the body in mm -hmm. acupuncture. And so we use that point to sort of push things down. 
There's also a lot of spots on the top of your feet, uh, gallbladder 41 and liver three, liver two, and pushing those points in the direction of your toes. So away from your ankles and towards your toes will give sort of the most relief. Okay. Um, going for acupuncture is a great way to prevent migraines mm -hmm. from happening. Mm -hmm. And I would strongly, you know, recommend that component. Yeah. Um, another really good thing. And I think you mentioned this whenever we were uh, emailing back and forth about this is biofeedback. Yeah. Um, that that's a great way of learning to listen to your body's signals. And through this technique, you can learn how stress and anxiety and food and drink choices, weather changes, hormonal fluctuations and other factors kind of impact the way that you feel. So with this information, you can learn to anticipate and prevent your migraines. Okay. And that's, that's, there's so many factors that could trigger a migraine. And so like understanding that your trigger, you could have multiple triggers. So right. it's not just, okay, if, if I learn that dairy is one, stay away from dairy, I'm good. Like, cause there could be multiple that, yes. that may or may not trigger it based on what else is going on. Like, cause you, as a, as a female, who's not menstruating, you could do the same exact things that week, but then when you are, you could do those things and it triggers a migraine. Am I right? Right. 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 Um, and kind of back to your question about um, what can you do to sort of stop it in the moment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have often recommended to patients to just take another magnesium supplement in that moment, mm -hmm. you know, start with a hundred milligrams, see if you can sort of stop it with that, yeah. uh, with that. And that frequently helps. Yeah. But again, please don't do that without having a conversation with a doc. Right. Right. Um, and then like, how much, how important is some of the other just like you mentioned sleep like obviously i think it i think i think people realize that when they you know people who are not like in their probably like 18 to 22 range because we can go without sleep at that for whatever reason right in that age of your life but uh but otherwise like we realize like okay if i only get four hours of sleep or six hours of sleep multiple nights in a row it eventually like catches up to us and we're like you know we're we're droggy we're cranky we're grumpy you know, that hydration, like some of these things are just really basic that we just need to make sure that we take care of ourselves. Right? Yeah. Yeah. All the things get better when we sleep. Yeah. All the things get better when we drink water. All the things get better when we eat more vegetables. You right. know, all the things get better when we eat lots of, of rich, um, you know, foods that have all the different colors of the rainbow, et cetera, right. et cetera. So just as a baseline, how to keep yourself living well for a longer period of time, those are all really important. Mm -hmm. um, I think something that's that's come out in the last, uh, I don't know, about five years or so, that's really interesting and not part of the, the um, general populace understanding about how sleep works is imagine your brain is like New York City. Mm -hmm. So there are no like alleyways, right? So the, all the garbage gets piled up on the sidewalks. Right. And it's only when we sleep that the sidewalks get swept. In addition, the buildings of New York City, imagine that they shrink between 20 and 30%. So now all of a sudden the streets are much, much wider. Right. That also happens when we sleep. Oh, wow. So not only do the buildings, like the cells themselves mm -hmm. get smaller, the parenchyma of the brain gets smaller, the spaces between the buildings get bigger, and then that's where all the garbage is. Gotcha. So those waste products really get cleaned up whenever we sleep at night. Yeah. That just sort of, I think that visualization helps to, yeah. to, <laughs> to really see, you know, what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have enough water in your system, you, you can't street sweep very properly, right? right. You, you really don't have the capacity to get things out of your system. Yeah. And the same thing with, if you're drinking a lot of alcohol, alcohol tricks the body into thinking that it's water. The chemical right. structure of ethanol is really, really similar to H2O. And so that goes into, that passes through the blood brain barrier and it irritates those layers, those meninges that are on the outside of the brain and causes more irritation. In addition, the, the uh, liver has to clean up that, mm -hmm. that alcohol. Right. And so if the liver is busy cleaning up the alcohol, it can't deal with the estrogen and the progesterone and the other um, hormonal fluctuations that are happening around a women's menstrual cycle. Right. And so it, it, it can't clean those out as quickly. And both of those two things together are really big combination 
um, or big components that can bind together and, and increase your risk of migraines. Okay. And, and that's not, and, and the alcohol that that's causing a different issue from like your, your hungover headache. Right. Right. Like, I mean, that's obviously right. an issue if you're, if you're having right. that, but it's still, again, something that could be, you drink, whether it's too much or, or, or not for like that given day or that that's something that could trigger a migraine down the road. Again, it's not just an immediate, the immediate's more of a hangover headache that you're worried about, but it's, are we into that like day, two days later that alcohol could still have an effect? So alcohol doesn't act like an irritant in the same way that dairy or gluten or some of the other food um, sensitivities would okay. because it, it, it's a much smaller molecule. Mm -hmm. It looks more like H2O. It has right. a carbon unit, but then it has an OH hanging off of it. And so your body really kind of thinks that that alcohol is the same thing as water. And most of it is absorbed actually through the stomach, which is why you get intoxicated so much faster if right. you drink on an empty stomach. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the, the, the alcohol component doesn't cause that sort of inflammatory downstream okay. effect. Okay. But having a really wicked hangover is the closest way to describe what it's like to have a bad migraine, yeah. <laughs> but just without some of the other symptoms. But that right. it's that irritation of the meninges, the the, the yeah. coverings of the brain that are affected in both situations. Okay. So, so I think a lot of people, maybe not all of us, but a lot of people can relate to that that hangover headache of like, oh my gosh, don't shut the door so loud. Or yes, know, yeah. So those are the same types of things that if somebody with a migraine is feeling. Right. Oh, that's painful. Um, yeah. So like, is there a, is there a, um, an age range that most people would say like that most people are affected by migraines? Is it, is it as young as like, you know, toddlers all the way up to elderly or is it, does it, is it impacted more based on where we are in life? Um, I want to say I had this kind of pulled up for you. I want to say it's somewhere the apex of the frequency of migraines is um, kind of younger women. It starts around the time that the menstrual cycle starts, mm -hmm. but then it sort of peaks between 30 and 39. Okay. Um, and then after people get a little bit older or women go into um, perimenopause and, and mm -hmm. menopause, then the, the frequency of the headaches starts to go down. Okay. And um, I, I shouldn't just talk about women. Testosterone yeah. also affects the hypothalamus. Mm -hmm. um, and so has some, uh, there is some early re or some more uh, recent research that also talks about men being strongly affected. And when their hormonal fluctuations are happening, they're also more likely to have migraines. Right. Sorry, guys, I didn't mean to exclude okay. you. Um, so, so it, I don't want to say it, it, does it, does it track with hormone fluctuations, but that definitely plays a, a part in whether you're going to have a migraine and or the severity of it. Right. Right. Okay. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're and, and to go back to the fight, flight, or freeze, like if we're if we're always in that state, you know, it, which so many of us are nowadays with, because of technology, that, that it, it's a great thing, but it also can help us stay in that state. Like, is that is that driving like a, an increase overall of people that are experiencing migraines, or or the people that having them having more of them? Um. I would like to answer that question from a traditional East Asian medicine perspective. Yep, please. So um, I've, I've recently written a book called Demystifying Acupuncture that mm -hmm. really talks about how acupuncture and traditional East Asian medicine sort of is not um, contradictory to Western medicine or conventional medicine. It, it can be used really adjunctively. Mm -hmm. And the context of, uh, of Chinese medicine around how migraines happen, I think makes a lot more sense in our current culture. Okay. So in Chinese medicine, we can divide things into five different elements, fire, earth, metal, water, and wood. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And in the wood element, this element is kind of like a bamboo shoot. It's all about sprouting up out of the ground, envisioning some kind of change, you know, and if you, you know that bamboo really just sort of shoots straight up in the air. And if you put a barrier on bamboo, it just kind of goes around and goes back to what it was doing, right? So the energy of wood is about growth. And that also is the energy of reproduction. Mm-hmm. Right. We're, we're going to grow a new human inside of right. one human. Right. We're going to incubate something and, and create something new. And that we literally call that our seed. Right. Mm-hmm. So the, the yep. change of the seed into a baby and so forth. So. But that that energy of being able to envision a change for yourself. Is also associated with the emotion of frustration. Mm -hmm. we're frustrated with the way that things are right now. So I'm going to make a change in my life. If we were all hundred percent happy living in our parents' basements, we would never move out. Right. Right. But because they drive us crazy, we leave. (laughs) (laughs) So it's, it's that kind of idea. Right. And, and in our culture, frustration is, is a kind of a bad emotion. We don't, we don't use it that way, Mm -hmm. but frustration in, in Chinese medicine is about driving change. It's about growth. So if we are inundated by advertising that is always talking about you should have a bigger house and a better car and a fancier pair of shoes and so forth the frustration turns into why don't i have more now right and people are are thinking constantly like i am entitled to x mm-hmm. y and z thing it's it's right. very different than people that grew up you know in the 1950s the 1920s without a lot of things and without the constant advertisement to get them to be in that place. When that frustration turns outward, then we're yelling and screaming at people in traffic and we're getting into fistfights in the grocery store and we're having problems with Black Friday and ripping things out of other people's hands and like crazy crap, right? When that frustration gets turned inward, it turns to hopelessness and depression. And so that hopelessness and depression, that frustration then is internalized. Mm -hmm. And instead of being a healthy change reproductive agent with the cycles of the menstrual system and so forth, that heat and frustration starts to rise and comes up in the gallbladder channel on the, the side of the head. Oh, wow. Okay. So it literally follows the channel pathway for the gallbladder channel and the the wood channels are the liver and the gallbladder. Mm -hmm. So, um, so releasing frustration um, through exercise, through diet, but also through conscious decision-making about what it is you want to put into your, into your thoughts. Do I really need to spend more money on a car? Right. Do I really need that pair of shoes? Is that a need or is it more important to be content? Yeah. Um, and so I, I really feel like the, the energetics of it, the emotional point of it, the, the, the satisfaction, the being at peace is a huge part of why we're seeing such a rise in migraines in our country. Yeah. Because it is definitely much more pronounced in Northern America than it is in other places in the world. Right. And I think a lot of that has to do with our priorities as a culture, winning, you have to do better, you have to be number one. We're extremely competitive people. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, it's, and you can see that that type of thing that our society is focused on, um, you know, you can link like the obesity changes to our food and you can go back to, you know, I know the, the, when, when the, what was it, the early nineties, when fast food was introduced to China and all of a sudden now their obesity rates are up where ours are when they weren't at all back then, you know, and it's like, you can exactly. see the different things that are linked. And as our, as our culture in America starts to spread, you start to see those same things start to, to be problems when, if we, if, if we, if we slow down enough you know, come to, come to the stop at the stop sign and actually stop and look and go, what is my problem? You know, and and like you said, because a lot of times it's, it's not that I need these other things. It's that I'm, I'm maybe trying to keep up with somebody else. And it's when we stop and go, wait a minute. Okay. I have, I have what I need. Let me now look at what I've got and make it as clean, as healthy as possible. 
Yeah. Like take the time to 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 rest in the moment. Maybe it's not sleep, but rest in the moment and say, okay, well, do I need all these things that I'm seeing on social media that that somebody else has, the vacation somebody else has, or whatever? And so we work so hard for that. And and we suffer the consequences of it, whether it's migraines or other health issues, because we're not letting our body come to a to us to a complete right. rest and stop and, right. and halt everything. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, I'm so grateful for social media because mm -hmm. as a military kid, I'm able to connect with all my friends that I have made from all the different places I've lived all over the world. Right. But on the other hand, most people don't put on social media their trials and tribulations. Right. So we see only the fabulous things. Yep. And then we're like, oh, I went to high school with that person. Why do they have a better job than I do? You know, th there's this, this competitiveness instead of being joyful for what other people have we right. start to think like they have everything i have and also this other thing yeah and yep. most of the time that's not the case you know yep. maybe your marriage is better and that person's kids are better behaved or whatever so there's yep. there's always give and take with all the different life uh lessons that we that we come into the world to learn right and uh i i think being balanced and being um satisfied being at peace being being centered and grounded um, it, is a really important lesson that our country has uh, has yet to learn. <laughs> right. Well, and that's a big. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I because I've I've had dry needling done, but I've never had true acupuncture done. Um, but so if my theory is or, or or my my thought is off, please correct me. But is that like having acupuncture? It's it's a way to to help your body reset. But also if if you go into it with an open mind and like, okay, I may have emotional releases with this because it's going mm -hmm. to, it it's a, the way it's supposed to work is to trigger something in your body to fix itself. And so there could be an emotional release that's causing whatever it is to be triggered, to be caught up, to be tight, to be causing yeah. issues. And yeah. so going into it, knowing like, okay, this is not just a stick a needle in, let's get this, this joint to work better or this nerve to work better whatever it's going to cause other things i'm going to have to stop and address well yes and yes and yeah okay. yeah so um in our in conventional medicine we have really separated out what happens you know above the <laughs> above right. the skull right yep. a, or you know in the brain versus what happens in the rest of the body we right. really don't talk about the effects were about um, feeling sad all the time and the emotion that or the effects that that has on the body or feeling right. fearful. We right. know that, that that little children might pee their pants if they get really scared, but we don't really talk about how fear manifests in in the body in other ways. Yeah. And in Chinese medicine, we look at say, I'm for everybody that can't see me, I'm holding up my hand and mm -hmm. I've got counting off on my fingers. So we have maybe some digestive complaints, we have migraine headaches, we have difficulty sleeping, um, we have pain in, in a knee and maybe um, just kind of having a hard time focusing and concentrating. Right. So in Western medicine, all of those would be treated by a different doctor. Yeah. Right. I would go see yeah. a gastroenterologist and I would see a neurologist for my migraines and I would see a sleep specialist about my difficulty sleeping. And I would right. see maybe a psychiatrist for ADHD diagnosis and so forth. Yep. In Chinese medicine, those are all symptoms of a root cause. Mm -hmm. So I might cheat, treat uh, spleen chi deficiency with dampness. Right. Or I might treat um, metal not controlling wood. Mm -hmm. And I would give acupuncture points that treat that root cause right. or that herbs that treat that root cause. So it's a very different mindset. It's, yeah. it's in some ways exactly the opposite. Right. And to your question about what are the acupuncture points doing, think about the entire interstate map on the, on the, uh, in the United States mm -hmm. and how all of those different streets kind of crisscross over each other. Right. At each one of those nodes where they crisscross at each one of the big cities is an acupuncture point. Okay. So if traffic is messed up in Denver, that's going to affect Utah and that's going to affect right. Idaho and that's going to affect, you know, uh, Wyoming and, and so forth. Right? right. If I can make Denver work better, 
then that affects all the rest of the traffic patterns of the mm -hmm. states around that. It also affects the traffic that's coming from as far away from New York, right? right. Because everything can slowly over time get backed up along yeah. Interstate 90 or 94 or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and so by by keeping the the conversation happening between all the different kinds of parts of the body, all the different organs, et cetera, that that free flow of of information along the highway map right. is maximized. Yeah. In the same way that we would talk about a blood vessel that has a clot in it, right? Yeah. The, the body will try to get around that, but it's not nearly as efficient as cleaning out the clot. Right, right. Does that kind of help? Yeah, <laughs> it does. Your question? Okay. It does. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's, it's fascinating to me how connected the body is, you know, and, and when we don't look at, you know, it, and sure, there, there, there could be times where my, my symptom is because of a root cause in that exact thing. But there's also times when my symptom is because of a root cause, it's in a completely different organ or system in the body. And, you know, if we don't take the time to look deeper, like we're, we may, we may fix the symptom in the short term, but that root cause is still there and it's going to pop up at some other time. Oftentimes when we really don't want it to, <laughs> right? Like we've all experienced right. that. Like, it's like, why am I sick right now? Like, why yeah. is this happening right now? When it's like, there's a, a lot of times you can link that back to something, maybe a year or two years, even longer before, where it's like, oh, I didn't take care of that then. And now all the added things, like you said before, all the different things that come in together and it puts you over the, over the tipping point. And all of a sudden now it's going to be an issue that it's going to be bigger than probably ever before because all the other stressors that are involved. And it's just, ama it's amazing to me how, if we, if we just take the time, which it does, I get it. It takes time and it takes effort to go in. But a lot of times we, we, we get so much more time back on the, on the back end of life because we took care of it at the root cause. Yeah, absolutely. So it goes back to sleep, reduce your sleep, right. stress, some kind of, you know, meditative or prayerful practice, something that is kind of a mind body uh, yeah. thing, exercise, drinking water, eating yeah. vegetables, like it, it just really fixes all the things. Yeah. It's such powerful preventative medicine. <laughs> yep, that it is. So you mentioned your book, Demystifying Acupuncture. How can people yeah. get that? And how can they, are, are you on social media? Can they follow you to learn more about what's going on and what you're doing? Oh, I would be honored. Um, I, Cena Smith is my name. And so almost it's an unusual enough name that it's pretty easy to find. Right. Um, so Cena Smith, MD, S I N A Smith, MD.com is my website. And on that are links for all my socials. I'm on Instagram and Facebook. I'm not doing a whole lot of TikTok yet, although my PR yeah. folks are pushing me right. to get into that. Yeah. Um, the book is available on Amazon um, in Kindle and, uh, in a, in a paperback copy. Mm -hmm. And then also it's available at any local bookstore. Cool. So you should be able to, to go in and they will order it for you. Um, cool. and if you prefer to not, uh, order through Amazon. Right. Awesome. Well, and I will link that so people can just click on it right away, um, in Thank the show you. notes and be able to get to that. So, um, so we covered, oh, go ahead. I also uh, give you um, a couple of links to places where people can get reliable information about migraines right. and migraine triggers and so forth. Yeah. There's a really good article that I had pulled for you um, that has sort of how does a migraine happen and foods mm -hmm. and kind of the genetic component and so forth. So if people are more awesome. interested, they can learn there too. Awesome. And so like we've covered a, a lot of ground. Um, is there anything for that for that person that's out there that is dealing with migraines that is you know, maybe this touched a nerve for them and they're like, okay, well, maybe, maybe this can help. Maybe that won't help. Maybe they're just, maybe they're so, they get so debilitated by them that they just don't know where to go or what to do. What, what's something that you can tell them to like, to, to help them get motivated or to just be on their side. Is there anything that we can do to just help them take that first step? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would highly recommend acupuncture. And I would recommend it over dry needling because dry needling is really just kind of a specific type mm -hmm. of acupuncture that's going into knotted muscles to help release right. them. Right. Um, and acupuncture is that whole body treatment. 
So look for somebody that has LAC, stands for licensed acupuncturist after their name. And that's somebody that is gone to four years of school and is boarded and is appropriately trained to be able to do acupuncture. Cool. The next person or the next kind of treatment you might recommend, especially if you're interested in food sensitivities, if you suspect that there's a lot of um, foods that are contributing to these problems are somebody that is uh, trained in functional medicine. And functional medicine looks at the body overall. They'll be able to look at your magnesium levels. They'll be able to assess food sensitivities. They'll look at your microbiome. How is your digestion working? Is there some mm -hmm. leaky gut that's causing leaky brain? All that kind of thing. Right. And then integrative medicine is a great place to go when you're looking for more of that mind-body connection. How can I decrease my stress in natural ways? Um, what are you know foods that I can eat that will be helpful? you know, and is kind of a good first stop for, I want to look into this more, but I'm not quite sure what other things I can do to help my migraines. Right. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you again, Dr. Smith, for being a guest. It's been a privilege. Um, I know I've learned a lot. So I know my guests or my uh, audience will have picked up some definite tidbits that will help them through migraines and, and, and other headaches as well. So Thank you again. Well, it's just been a delightful conversation, Jerry. Thank you so much again for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for checking out the Confidence Through Health podcast. Please subscribe, post a review, share this episode with those you love who need a little extra help with their health journey. Visit allinhealthandwellness.com to learn more about the coaching programs that I provide. All episodes are produced by the Social Media Cowboys, your source for all online marketing needs. Go to socialmediacowboys.com for more information.